Well, I want to begin this morning's message with a confession of sorts. I'm not very good at sitting still, and I'm easily distracted. Now, this isn't a problem when I'm doing something like watching the Colts game. And in fact, last weekend, it was good that I was easily distracted because it was a little less painful. (laughs) But it is a problem when I'm trying to do more important things. For instance, uh, I love to get up early in the morning while the house is still quiet, grab a cup of coffee, uh, grab my Bible or my iPad, which has got the Bible app on it. And it's a great time of day for me to sit before my mind starts to get cluttered with all the things that happen. And as I'm sitting there trying to read my Bible, one of several things usually happens. I get a text because I forgot to put my phone on Do Not Disturb. I happen to glimpse at a headline of a news story that looks interesting, and I think, well, I'm just going to take a quick peek. Or out of habit, I click into my email and then immediately see that there's a whole list of things that I didn't address yesterday or came in through the, uh, the night. This one probably doesn't happen to you, but it does happen to me periodically. My dog starts to kick me because she wants something. Now, I don't know who trained my dog to, to kick me or to kick, but it's just a little thing that she does. But, um, But before I know it, I'm three distractions in, and I've passed 10 minutes, and I haven't read my Bible. Now, my staff also knows that I struggle a little bit when I'm supposed to be working on my messages, and I'm coming out of my office, and occasionally they'll stop me and say, aren't you supposed to be in your office working on your message? Which is why I usually work on my messages from the house, because there's just fewer distractions. Now, the truth is, I'm probably not the best person to talk about today's topic. It would probably be better to have my friend Brian, who runs a retreat center, or my friend Rudy, who's really good at praying and listening to God's spirit. But then the more I thought about it, I thought maybe I'm the perfect person to, do, to talk about this topic today, because I suspect in many ways I'm like many of you. And the problem isn't just that I'm distracted or unfocused or in a, in a hurry much of the day. That's part of the problem, but the problem also goes deeper. I think it's, there's symptoms of a deeper issue. You see, I've got a lot of things that I want to do in my life, a lot of things that I want to accomplish, a lot of things that I'm striving for. And as I was thinking about that word striving, I looked it up and the Oxford definition says, striving is to make great efforts to achieve or obtain something. And the truth is we're all striving for something. You know, we want to be a good person and we want to have great relationships in our lives and we want our kids to be all that they can be in all aspects of their lives. And we want to succeed in job and career Uh, We want to succeed at feeling good, so we work hard at relaxing, at entertainment, and our hobbies, at vacation. Even we work hard at good food. And then there's church. I think most of us want to do our part at church as well. And, And by the way, when you work at a church, this can get even more confusing. The truth is, we want to succeed at everything. But here's the problem. If you want to experience transformational community like we were intended for, we need to start to trade all this striving for something else. Now, working hard to achieve goals isn't bad because most of the things that we're striving to achieve are good. But instead of striving, we're called to thrive. And on the surface, they can look similar, but they're fundamentally different in substance. You know, one of the things that Jesus said to his disciples, he said, my purpose is to give them life, them meaning us, his followers. Uh, My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And this morning, we're going to look at what Jesus meant and how we get there. And then we're going to be faced with the question that we've been faced with every week of this series. Am I willing to make the trade? You know, in this series, we've been examining some of the trades that we are called to make to experience the community and the kind of relationships that we were created for. We must be willing to trade old habits and behaviors for new ones. And we're in the third week of our series titled Trading Up, Renovating Our Lives to Experience Transformational Community. 
Now, my definition of transformational community is one where we are loved as we are and invited to grow into who we were created to be. And this type of transformational community is important to our health and to our growth. We can't become the kinds of people that we were intended to be without this type of community. And so there's really three goals for the series, and hopefully the, the, the series has uh, helped you think uh, about these things. But basically, we want you to find a transformational community if you don't have it. If you're in a community of sorts, we want you to bring uh, all of who you are and help make that a transformational community for yourself and for others. And the truth is we're surrounded by people who don't have that kind of community. And so we want to erase our awareness of the importance of it so that we can maybe invite others to come along. And I've been encouraged, by the way, to see the amount of uh, ladies that have jumped into women's groups and guys every week. There's new guys jumping into men's groups, and then we're doing Group Connect tonight. Well, in week one, we looked at the trading of uh, trading, getting, forgiving, and how what we bring, our focus needs to what we bring to help create transformational community to others. And if you weren't here that week and you didn't get a chance to hear Matt's story, Matt shared his story with us, which was real, really powerful as he shared just the change from the way he grew up and the shift that has come in his thinking and the trades that he's made. And then last week, Rob looked at trading independence, which is a very kind of American, kind of I can do it all myself value for interdependence, the, the need that we have for one another and the willingness that we have to depend on one another. And this week, we're going to look at a new topic. We're going to look at trading striving for thriving. And so I want to encourage you, grab a Bible, grab your phone or your Bible app, um, and turn to John chapter 15. I want to say welcome to our friends that are online. We're glad that you're joining with us, whether you're watching now or watching later. Well, a little bit of context while you turn to John chapter 15. Uh, this is the night before Jesus was arrested. Uh, he gives a long farewell talk that actually spans uh, chapters 14 through 16. He's washed his disciples' feet. Uh, Judas is left to betray him. The Last Supper is finished. The miracles and events of Jesus' public ministry are finished and complete. And Jesus is preparing for his final act of love. He's soon going to be arrested, and he's going to sacrifice himself for his disciples and for us. Now, if you look at these chapters 14 through 16, what you see is much of the conversation is about the relationship between Jesus and his heavenly father and Jesus and his disciples, and he wants that relationship to continue. And so what we see in the beginning of John chapter 15, we see Jesus beginning to talk about this, and he talks about it in a little different way than he's talked about it up to this point. And here's what he says to his disciples. I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. You see, Jesus, every time he teaches, uses everyday language and everyday examples, things that they would have known from their world, things that they could connect with. And so Jesus uses this image of a vine and a vineyard and um, they would have been familiar with that, and I'm convinced if Jesus would have been doing ministry in central Indiana, he might have said something more like, I'm the true corn stalk, but uh, I'm the true vine really does have a better sound. And so we're introduced in Jesus' metaphor to kind of three groups of people, or three people. The first is Jesus describes himself as a grapevine. He talks about how God the Father is the gardener, and then we'll find out that we're the branches. Now, when Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, it's easy to kind of read over that and just move into the metaphor, but he's making a pretty staggering statement because in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish nation was often defined as the grapevine. And Jesus is making the statement that he is the true fulfillment of God's purposes in the world now. And he is also saying that I am in the source of life, the source of life for you and the source of life for the world. And then he begins to talk about this idea of pruning. 
Now, pruning, for those of us who probably don't spend a lot of time with grapevines, is something that's necessary to trim off extra shoots that the grapevine has. Most grapevine branches will have more shoots than they can possibly bear fruit on, or the fruit won't be very good, and so you have to trim off the extra shoots. And so Jesus is describing that, and, and I've not done grapevines, but several years ago we had a friend that was, had an orchard and he was selling the land, and so he invited anybody that wanted an apple tree to come get an apple tree, and he gave a little lesson on how you trim an apple tree. And he said, you're going to cut this thing down to where it feels like there's almost nothing left and there's kind of one main branch and a few shoots out of it. And he said, you have to keep doing this every year. You have to do it over and over and over. And the tense of the language here is that when it says God, our Heavenly Father is going to be doing this pruning, it's an ongoing process that happens over and over and over. And it's the thing that needs to happen in our lives to make us fruitful. So John, or Jesus continues in verse 3 when he says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I've given you. You see, Jesus had spent years with his disciples. He'd been teaching them. And this word that's translated, it's actually one word. It says pruned and purified. It actually has kind of a double meaning. It means this idea of pruning, but it also means cleansing or clean. And Jesus is reminding them that the work that he's done over the past three years with him, they're prepared, they're cleansed and they're prepared to be fruitful. And then we get to the point where I think this is really the point that Jesus is getting to in verse four when he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Now this word that we read is remain, and it's actually used nine times in 12 verses, and there's more if you count the fact that it's implied in several cases. And this is a fundamental command that we're given as Jesus followers to remain in Jesus. It's also the fundamental relationship that Jesus has with his heavenly Father. And so Jesus is asking us to do one thing relate to him in the same way that he relates to his heavenly father. And it's all wrapped up in this one word. Now, this word isn't a particularly complicated word, but it does have kind of several meanings, and it essentially means to stay in one place. It's used in a way if somebody's heading out on a journey or if they're on a journey, they may pause, or it may mean to wait, to stay in some place and wait for something. It can also be used to describe something or someone who is unchanging. They persist, they survive, they remain. And it's sometimes translated as a word that we don't use often uh, much, but you hear it sometimes, and I think we use it at church probably more than in common usage, but it's the word abide. But at its heart, it really means don't depart or stay here. And I think Jesus' words are so simple and so disarming. He's saying, stay with me and I'll stay with you. And I think if you took the whole of scriptures and what we're commanded to do as Jesus' followers, I think it's summed up in this idea of remaining. Jesus' words, remain in me and I will remain in you. And if you think about the night that they've had with Jesus, they've actually experienced this in a really physical form. They had just, Jesus had served them communion for the first time. They took the bread and they took the wine and they literally taken it. These symbols that Jesus said, these are a picture of me and my sacrifice and they'd physically taken them into themselves. Now, if you read and continue to read through this passage, what you see is that Jesus repeats these same ideas over and over in verses 5 through 8. And anytime any, something's repeated in the scriptures, it's important and, and it's repeated. And then again, we see the same idea repeated in verse 9. So if you jump down to verse 9, where Jesus says, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. There's that word again. And when you obey my commands, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus is reminding them, don't just listen to my teaching, but live it out 
and do it in a way that is connected with me. And then in the next verse, he says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And so as we remain in Jesus, as we continue to develop our relationship with him, it begins to overflow out of our lives. And we see where this overflow goes in verse 12, because I think this is why he says this. He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I've loved you. Jesus has loved us. He's poured himself into his disciples, and he wants to see that love overflow. And then he adds this. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, again, notice the progression that's repeated multiple times. God the Father loves Jesus, and their relationship remains um, intimate. Jesus loves us, and the relationship is intimate. And then we're called to love one another and to have that relationship flow into one another. And the order is important because that's what gives us the power to love one another like Jesus does. And the problem with striving rather than thriving is that it negatively impacts our community. In fact, it does so and and can in several ways. When we're so busy striving and pursuing things that we want in our life and trying to grab a hold of things, often we're so worn out, especially at the end of the day when we're with the people that we are called to be the most invested in, we're worn out and we can't offer the best of what we have to give them. I think when we're striving, sometimes it's easy to begin to treat people like a commodity or look for people for what they can do for us rather than us loving them and caring for them as Jesus loves them. And then I think the last thing that we can do when we're focused on striving rather than thriving is that we look to something or to someone to give us life that only Jesus can give us. And I'm reminded of something that my wife said to me early on in our marriage that really stuck with me. She said, I love, to, I love you, but I need to look to God first to fulfill all of who I am. And friends, that really freed me up because I didn't feel like I had to carry the weight of fulfilling every need and everything, uh, all of who she was. But it also challenged me because I began to think I have to look to Jesus to fulfill the needs in in me first before I go to my wife. And I think sometimes we put weight on other people to meet our needs in a way that only Jesus can. It's almost as if we want them to be Jesus for us, and we need to keep the order intact. Now, in verse 12 and 13, we can read this in a couple of different ways. Um, Jesus' command Uh, to love one another. And then when he adds this, he says, be willing to lay down our life for our friends. I think we can view that as a command uh, to follow, that we're to love like he's loved and lay down our lives for our friends. But I think it can also be viewed as a promise in light of verse 14. Because you see, Jesus implies that when we obey his commands, that he counts us as friends and I think when he says that he's, there's no greater love than one who lays down his life for his friends, I think Jesus is telling them, and they don't fully understand it yet, that Jesus has promised to lay down his life for them. And I think we need to see this both as a command, but also a promise that Jesus is there and will continue to lay down his life for us. Now jump down to verse 16. And we're coming to the close of this passage, and then we'll begin to talk about what do we do with this. Verse 16, he says, You didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Now, when he says you, and this is really important to this series when we're talking, is this you isn't mean you or you or you. It means you. It means all of us. And so when Jesus is speaking to them, he said, you didn't choose me, speaking to the collective, his followers, his disciples. He said, I chose you and I chose you to produce fruit. And I think this is a promise. So when we hear these words, again, I think it's an opportunity for us 
to not feel the way of all that needs to happen in this world, but for us to trust and follow what Jesus is wanting to us to accomplish. Now, we haven't even really talked about what's meant by fruit, and I, and I thought about spending time on this, but the truth is the fruit that Jesus is talking about is everything that flows from our lives when we remain in him and we trust in him. And it's more than just the things that we accomplish in our lives, which is what I think we tend to think, at least that's what I tend to think. I think about the things that I'm going to do for Jesus, but I think it's broader than that. I think it's talked about our obedience, our experience of joy and peace and love in this world when we're remaining in him, our witness in the world, who we're becoming, everything that's a result of us following Jesus. Now, what do we do with all of this? Um, what does it look like for us to remain in Jesus and to replace striving with thriving? And this is where I want to add a little bit to that idea. To experience transformational community, we need to trade striving for thriving through abiding. Said it in a way that hopefully you can remember it. We need to trade striving for thriving through abiding. You see, when we trade striving for thriving, we go from doing to done. The focus shifts from what we need to do with, to what Jesus has done on our behalf. And I think it's the shift of what we see from the Old Testament and to the New Testament was all that they were called to do and obey to what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. And I think what we're called to do this, we're called to do this in two ways that Jesus talked about in this passage. We're called to do this by allowing ourselves and our lives to be pruned by our Heavenly Father and by remaining in intimate and ongoing relationship with Jesus. Let's first talk a little bit about what it, this idea of pruning. I read this quote from N.T. Wright that I think spoke to this idea really beautifully. Uh, he, and N.T. Wright said, you prune the rose to help it be its true self. And the truth is, if you've ever dealt with the rose bush, there's parts of it that kind of grow wild or it has spent blooms that need to be trimmed so that the rose bush is even more beautiful and that it thrives. And the truth is, I have things in my life that need to be pruned. I've got secondary goals and ambitions, things that I think will bring me life, but are really filling my life with more to do and making my life feel cluttered. And I think the other thing for me that needs to get trimmed is my addiction to distraction and hurry. And my guess is you've got things in your life that need to be pruned as well. Uh, I read this interesting book this week. Uh, it's by a pastor. His name is John Mark Comer. The book is titled The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he said this. He said, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And then he goes on to say a little later in the book, Corey Ten Boom, who was somebody, uh, a gal who lived through the Holocaust, if you're not familiar with her life, uh, Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. There's truth in that. Both sin and busyness have, have the same exact effect. They cut off your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. And I love the subtitle of this book when he says, uh, the, uh, uh, the subtitle is how to remain or how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. And he's a pastor who was leading a successful church that realized in the midst of pastoring and all the demands that he had on his life needed, uh, he had drifted in his relationship with Jesus. And so he shifted his role in his church. He actually took a step down. He was still serving with his church, but he took a role that had less responsibility so that he could focus on cultivating his relationship with Jesus. Now, the irony of me reading this book this week is that my friend Brian that I mentioned earlier had given me or told me to read this book several years ago, and I've been too busy to read it. And actually, <laughs> I started reading it. I realized I started to read it, and I got distracted halfway through. So this week, I actually read the book, and I finished it. And Friends, it's an exceptional book. But I think the first way that we remain is that we allow God to do pruning in our life. Sometimes he does that through hardship and difficulty, 
but he also does it as we remain in him in intimate relationship. We learn to live like he does and we begin to let go of those things that we maybe can grip and hold of and we begin to live more slowly, more simply, more intentionally. Now, I read uh, this other quote that I think speaks to this second idea, the idea of remaining in relationship and learning to abide. This is a book that Josh Weber shared with me, and I only read a little part of this, which, um, but it was a great quote. It says, finally it hit me, abiding is the key to abounding. I can't live the Jesus life, only Jesus can, and he wants to live his life through me. The key isn't striving to be like Jesus, but instead me abiding in Jesus. And this writer, Vince, uses this analogy of a humidifier, which we use a humidifier in our house because the air is so dry in the Indiana winters. And if you use one, you fill it up with water and it puts off air, but, or it puts off the water vapor into the air to make the air a little breathable, a little more breathable. But the thing is, if you're not paying attention to your humidifier, it can run and run and run and not do anything. And the truth is that our lives are in this, we can do that in the same way in our lives. We're called to be filled with Jesus and then release that as we live our lives. You know, I've really been on this journey, even though I joked about just reading this book, I've been on this experience of learning to trust and rest in Jesus for the past couple of years. And while I'm not very good at it, I'm still trying. And I have moments where I would say over the past couple of weeks, I became more aware of just how much striving I've been doing. But the truth is, I don't think I would have survived the last couple of years and all the stuff that has happened here at Grace Fishers and all the things that we have, have been, the transitions that we've gone through without learning to occasionally stop and realize that I'm striving And then I need to let go of trying to control everything in my life and trust that Jesus will accomplish the things that he wants to. And friends, when we take those little steps, even when they feel like baby steps, it's like a father does when when he sees his child take his first steps. I think there's joy and there's peace uh, and there's celebration in the way. And I felt those moments, even though in a lot of ways I feel like a beginner, our Heavenly Father invites us to do to to do that and live like that now there's lots of spiritual practices that i could share and we could talk to you about solitude and slowing down and sabbath Um, again if you want to read more and dive deep into this topic i recommend john mark comer's book ruthless elimination of hurry but let me give you a couple of simple things that are easy to try this week and i would encourage you to pick one of them or come up with one of your own and the first is just a simple way to practice silence either in the morning or in the evening or maybe over your lunch hour, set a timer. I know this sounds kind of strange, but set a timer and practice actually sitting still for three minutes. And when I'm busy and I'm active, this is one of the hardest things to sit and just listen to God. But what I find is after I do it uh, over time and I practice multiple times, I learn to love the quiet. I learn to love the stillness. I love to learn the space. The second idea is to literally slow down. Now, this was so hard because I started doing this this week. When you're driving, actually drive the speed limit. And I have a short commute along 126th Street, so I don't know why I'm in such a hurry. But driving 40 miles an hour along this road has been a bit of a challenge for me. (laughs) But I would encourage you to try it. And in this space, use it as quiet, shut off the radio, kind of still your heart. And when you hit a stoplight, don't grab your phone and see if you can do an email in the next 15 or 20 seconds. Use the space in the car to celebrate and practice slowing down. The third idea I would encourage you to do is just to try to practice God's presence throughout the day. And you can use this verse from John 15, verse 4, remain in me and I will remain in you as a breath prayer. And I would encourage you to just reflect on that a couple of times a day to, to kind of engage in conversation with your heavenly father. And then the last way that I love to just sit and remain in Jesus, sometimes this is just a great way for me when I'm feeling especially busy and harried, 
is I'll sit and I'll listen to a song. For me, it's best if it's early in the morning. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not multitasking. I just sit and listen to the words. And often when I'm listening to a worship song that kind of speaks to where my heart is at or where my heart needs to be, I start to recenter myself and I begin to remain in a different way. And we're going to do that actually this morning. The band is going to come out and they're going to begin to play a song over us. And we're going to have some space to begin to listen. And while they're coming, uh, I want to invite you as we begin this time, I want to encourage you to just close your eyes. And I'm going to read the first few verses of John chapter 15 over you. Jesus said this to his disciples. I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. I'm the prince. 
the night.